right. You ready? Yep, we're ready to go. All right. Well, welcome. Uh, it's been almost uh, 10 months since uh, Lee and I started the first uh, Zoom meeting, um, just on a discussion of trying to help uh, teachers uh, through this pandemic. And, and, and this time we've had a great, great list of speakers. And we started with Alan Rossman as our first speaker. And we are ending uh, the first year of this with Luke Wilcox um, from AP or from Stats Medic. Luke uh, teaches intro stats and advanced placement stats at East Kentwood High School, which is very close to where I live in Muskegon, Michigan. He's from Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's a public school in West Michigan. Uh, and this school is beating the odds. He believes that students and teachers learn best when they are in a, uh, there's a context to connect to their learning. Notably, uh, Luke is the 2017-2018 Michigan Teacher of the Year and was previously recognized uh, as the Presidential Award winner for mathematics. He has a master's degree in math education from Grand Valley State University and completed his undergraduate mathematics and physics degree at the University of Michigan. Luke is also one of the co-creators of Stats Medics, along with his colleague, Lindsay Gallus. So we are uh, pleased to present to you tonight, Luke Wilcox. All right, thanks, uh, Bob, for that introduction. And, and thank you to Bob and, and Lee for getting this all set up and inviting me to do this uh, several months ago. And, uh, you know, when Lee approached me, I thought, you know, my, one of my favorite things is, is AP exam review, and I, I feel like I have some strategies that would be helpful for teachers. And so uh, that's going to be the, uh, the focus of our session today is to hopefully give you some ideas that you can take back to your classroom in the next month. You know, um, we always worry that when we go to like a conference or a workshop that, uh, you know, when am I ever going to use this? Well, my hope is that like you can literally take some of these strategies and like bring those right back to your classroom like as early as, as tomorrow. Um, I do want to, uh, anytime I get the chance, I'd like to brag about East Kentwood High School a little bit. And I know Bob said a few words and he's, he's close by, so he knows East Kentwood. Um, but we are the, uh, the number one most diverse public high school in the state of Michigan. We have students from over 70 different countries in our hallway, um, also very diverse socioeconomically. So we have about 60% of our students are free and reduced lunch, but it's just a beautiful place to, to, to teach. Uh, my whole teaching career has been there 21 years, uh, 15 of which I've been, been teaching AP stats. Um, one thing I do wanna mention here uh, that you'll see in blue here is uh, a link to a website where I put everything that we're gonna talk about today so that you don't have to scramble to try and like write things down or collect uh, resources. Everything is on this page. So I'd actually just like to real quick uh, show you what that looks like so that you can uh, access any of the stuff that we talk about today here. So um, this is the page it'll take you to. It's just statsmedic.com slash top 10 review. And so I am giving away my, my 10 strategies right here, but um, I'm going to go through and talk in detail about each one of these 10 strategies that you see. Um, at the bottom of the page there, you'll also see that you can click for the PowerPoint. So if you're interested in using something from the PowerPoint, uh, you'll have access to that as well. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right into things here. Um, I do want to start out with uh, uh, goals, my, my learning targets for this session, which is very similar to how I run my own classroom. Um, so here's my, my goal for this session. Uh, I really hope that you teachers will leave this session with one or more, I'm hoping or more, activities that you can use in your classroom in the next month in preparing students for the AP stats exam. Now, a um, couple of things that I just wanted to sort of put out there, like this year, has been a crazy year. I understand that this year has been a crazy year. Uh, it's been challenging to get through all the content in the same time frame that we've had in the past. Everybody's in different places. Some people are scrambling to finish up content. I, I totally want to acknowledge and, and recognize that. Um, everyone also has te different teaching schedules. You know, you may be in a block schedule. You may be in five hours a day or six hours a day. A lot of schools move to four days a week instead of five days a week. You may be all online. Like everyone has a, a, a different teaching schedule that's here. Um, and you all have different student populations. You serve different students in, in your own uh, high school settings there. Now, um, this is all to say that I don't want you all to be looking for reasons why these strategies won't work. What I'm hoping is that you look at these 10 strategies and try to think about 
what will work for you in your setting. And my guess is that if you're spending an hour out of your evening to be here with me on a Monday night, that you're probably one of the types of people that's looking for solutions and not looking for excuses. And uh, so um, I, I'm hoping that you'll be able to find something that you'll be able to bring back to your uh, classrooms. So I'm gonna jump right in here. Uh, number, number one strategy for AP Stats review is the student created inference test. And um, I will tell you that all of the 10 of these strategies that I'm gonna be sharing with you are like tried and tested in my own classroom over the last 15 years. This particular one, I did the week before spring break. Uh, today was the first day back from spring break. So we finished this student created inference test uh, the, the, the Thursday right before uh, spring break. And the idea with this is that um, students obviously have to be familiar with confidence intervals and significance tests. We know that they need to know that on the AP exam, they need to be able to just nail it like that on a, on a free response question. Um, and so the, the uh, purpose of this is to be a summary of all of the confidence intervals and the significance tests that they've learned throughout the year. You know, there's a long list of them that could show up on the AP exam. Uh, and I want them to get practice with, with uh, a lot of them. So in this activity, students create their own questions. And um, depending on what you have time for this year, I had my students make one question that was a confidence interval and two questions that were significance tests. And I think this one's worth sharing. Uh, I have a student named Henry. He told me it was okay if I shared this, but during the year I'd hand out all my lessons. I always use you know, my stats medic lessons. They're all printed in Arial font. And for whatever reason, Henry hates Arial and he thinks that everything should be Comic Sans. Now he's totally wrong but I, I humored him one chapter and I, I made copies of all the lessons in Comic Sans and I let him use those lessons, that, that particular chapter. And so he did really well on that test and he claimed that it was because the lessons were in Comic Sans rather than Ariel. So this is his, his question that he wrote, setting up an experiment to see whether Comic Sans would beat Ariel if we you know, randomly assigned it to students. Um, and so you know, this is a, a two sample uh, t-test for the difference of uh, means. Um, but what I like about this activity is that Henry had to think about what needs to be included when I write a question like this. And he had to recognize that you have to include the means for each sample and you have to include the standard deviations for each sample and you have to include the sample sizes or the group sizes for each one of them. Uh, so he had to think about that as he was creating the question. Now, he also had to make sure that all the conditions were met. That was one of my requirements on this assignment. And so when they have to think about it from the other side of creating the question, it's just a different way of approaching that idea of like checking conditions. Um, and then of course, Henry had to make a rubric for this because he was gonna grade somebody's test. So each one of my students writes their own set of questions. I have to approve them all because some of them definitely need uh, some help. Uh, and uh, on test day, every student comes in with a blank copy of their test and I randomly assign their test to somebody else in class, and that student has to take that exam. And so there's 30 different exams out in the room. Once they're finished, you know, whoever took Henry's uh, exam is gonna give it back to him, and then he has to use his rubric in order to go through and grade it. And that's just like a really important way for students to recognize what needs to be included on a confidence interval or a significance test when they actually have to grade it using their own rubric. Uh, number two, strategy number two, this is a, a video that uh, it's available on Stats Medic. It's linked on the, on the website. Uh, there's a video there on, on how to crush the free response. So this is not a video that goes through content. This is more a video that talks about strat strategy specifically for the AP exam. And of course, the free response is half of the grade on the AP exam. And so students being ready for that is, is really important. So I'm just gonna give you sort of the quick highlight of, of what this video is about. <clears throat> um, the first strategy I tell students is you, you gotta know what to expect when it comes to the free response. Um, of course, every, every exam is different, but you can see here this list of bullet items. Generally speaking, you're gonna have a question that's on one variable statistics. You're gonna have one question that's on two variable statistics. You're gonna have something that has to do with like sampling methods or experimental design. Um, the probability question usually sort of jumps out at you like, oh yeah, this is the probability question this year. Uh, of course, we know one question is going to be a significance test 
And then we, are, we know for sure number six is gonna be an investigative task. So I always tell students to you know, know what to expect on the free response. Uh, secondly, I, I talk about the investigative task, question number six, and notice I use the word survive here. Um, you don't have to ace it. It's not a, you know, you don't have to get a four out of four on the investigative task, but you do have to get your, get some points on the investigative task. And so I think that's a, an important strategy. Uh, number three, I tell them that they got to have a plan going into the AP exam. Like which questions are you going to do and in which order? And for a lot of my students, they're just fine going one through six. And they know that because they've taken a practice, practice exam within the 90 minutes and they know that that process works for them. Now for other students, that doesn't work. They end up not finishing in 90 minutes. And I have a different suggestion for them. I tell them to start out with number one, because it's generally a pretty easy question. They're going to get some points on it. I tell them next to look for the significance test, because we've been practicing those and you're going to do really well on those. So find the significance test. Then I say find the one on probability, because it usually goes pretty quick. Uh, and then from there, you have to sort of fill that in. Investigative task, I sort of leave that up to them, but I do. I do suggest to them that they don't leave the investigative task to be the last question because it's worth 25% of the, of the free response. So I just want them thinking about what their approach is gonna be. What questions are they gonna do and in what order? Uh, and then the last strategy here is to, to make sure that you, you get all your points. And here I'm talking about like the easy points. And easy points are like, don't leave anything blank you know, there's no penalty for making a guess on something. So certainly don't leave anything blank. Um, if you're stuck on part B and you need the answer from part B for part C, then make up a number that's a reasonable number for part B and then just use that answer for part C. They certainly can still get credit for part C. And then the other big one, which shows up on uh, every year in, in, in the rubric somewhere is to include context uh, in their answers on the free response. Okay, number three, going back to significance tests. Um, I have a, a one full day where uh, I do this activity called name that significance test. Uh, we know one of the free response questions is gonna be a significance test. And one of the biggest challenges on that for students is to quickly read the question and identify what type of test it is. Because if they choose the wrong test, they're gonna have a hard time getting many, many points on that particular free response. And so the first thing that I share with them is uh, this, uh, flow chart here, just like a way of sort of thinking through the, the possibilities. And in this flow chart, the first part that you see here in this flow chart, I think is like sort of like special cases, like linear regression t-test, that's going to be very much a special case. And I think unlikely to be there. But if it is, it's, it's probably the case that they're going to give some computer output, right, in order for students to have like the standard error of the slope. Um, the next special case is the chi-squared test. Students are usually pretty good at identifying those because we did those like right at the end of the year. You know, there's three different types of chi-squared tests and there is a flow chart here for them to decide what type of chi-squared test, depending on how many samples or how many groups in the experiment, as well as how many variables. And most of the time on the AP exam, we're gonna end up over here on the right side of the flow chart. And it's pretty easy because there's two questions you have to ask yourself. Are we in the world of means or the world of proportions? And that usually jumps right out at you just by looking at the, the information that's given. And then how many, how many samples or how many groups do we have? Is it one sample or is it two samples? And once you can answer those two questions, it's pretty easy to identify the type of significance test uh, that they wanna use there. So after we talk through this flow chart, we look at some of the details of the flow chart. I have an activity that uh, students go through. It's a Google form where I'm gonna give them a bunch of uh, old AP exam questions. And all they have to do is identify the type of test. They don't have to actually you know, do the test. They just have to identify the type of test. So here's what the Google form looks like. And uh, you can see, you'll probably even recognize some of these questions. You know, They're taken from old AP exams. And all they have to do here is click in and say, what type of, uh, what type of test is it, right? And I think there's 16 or 17 of these. And of course, with the Google form, the nice thing is, is that after all the students have submitted their answers, I can go in and look at the ones that students had the most trouble with. I can pull those up on the whiteboard and we can talk about like why that was challenging. Like why was it difficult to identify the type of test for that particular one? And this usually takes a, a pretty full class period in order to talk through the flow chart. 
as well as uh, for them to go through this Google form activity there. So that is number three, name that significance test. Uh, number four is uh, about the formula sheet. So, you know, students get a formula sheet on the AP exam. It's nice for them to know what it looks like, when they might use it. And mostly it just sort of like, is like a thing that makes them feel comfortable that they have that formula sheet, even though like, it's not really all that likely they're gonna use it that often. And so I do take them through sort of step-by-step step everything that's on the formula sheet. Um, now, one little note here, you probably all know this, but there was a new formula sheet in 2020 that was released along with the CED from the college board. And so the formulas that you're seeing here, that this is from the new formula sheet, not the old formula sheet. And there's some things I like about it. There's some things I don't like about it, but um, just to point out a couple, uh, the thing that I like here is they got rid of a couple of formulas that we never use. There was a pooled standard deviation formula that's no longer there. The other thing I like here in this formula for the um, LSRL, the, um, they're using A and B. I think the other ones were B0 and B1. I didn't like that as much. I like A plus BX uh, here for the, the line of uh, best fit. Um, so that's, that's section one. Section two looks like this. I like how it's organized in a nice, neat table. I do need to uh, uh, remind my students about the union and the intersection symbols and what those mean, because they're, they're, they're more used to ors and ands. Um, the other thing that I want to point out here that is new for this year, for the geometric distribution, they are giving the formula here for the standard deviation of a geometric distribution. That formula was not on the previous version of the, of the formula sheet. So that is something that's new that certainly could be something that shows up on the AP exam. And then section three, the one that I think is probably the most important, this is the one dealing with inference, confidence intervals and significance tests. And here's how they organized it. What they did up here is they gave what I call the general formulas. Okay, this is the general formula for a, a standardized test statistic. This is the general formula for a confidence interval. Now the specific formula depends on whether you're in the world of means, the world of proportions, the world of slopes, and you have all your formulas down here that you can go back and just substitute in uh, to make the specific formulas there. Um, one thing to point out in, the, in this formula here, you see standard error. Uh, sometimes that is the standard deviation of the statistic. You know, if it's a, a one sample proportion, that would actually be the standard deviation, not the standard error. Um, okay, number five, one of my favorite activities to do at the end of the year I've been collecting things all year long. I have posters up all around my room. I've got dot plots everywhere. I hope you all do too. I love the dot plot. Um, the gallery walk is my opportunity to show off some of those activities that we did previously in the year. And so before students arrive around the room, I'll usually set up, I would say seven to 10 different stations that have something from the school year. Now, not all of them are posters. I might even have like a, a computer out with this power applet on it. Um, so some sort of, some sort of uh, you know, evidence from a lesson that we did earlier in the year. I've got those set up all around the room. And then I split my students up into groups of usually three. I find that three works nicely. And each group of three or four goes to one of those stations. And I set the timer and they have four minutes. And in those four minutes, they have to like go back in their minds to that activity and remember what the activity is about, but more importantly, remember what is the statistics that we learned as a result of that activity. And so they have a handout that they have to fill out as they're, uh, as they're walking from station to station where they describe the activity, the context, and then they try to remember what are the important statistical concepts that they learned. So every four minutes, I shuffle them over to the next station. And when they get to the very last station, I actually make each one of the groups share out. I give them like a minute or two to share out. What are the big uh, takeaways from that particular lesson? And that gives me a chance to make sure that they, they got what they needed to, but also for me to add in my own comments if I want to, if there was something that they missed on that particular activity. Okay, I wanna pause. We are at a halfway point. I mean, I am gonna give you 10 strategies. I've given you five so far, so we had this student created inference test where Henry writes his own questions, grades his own exam, the crush the free response video, the name that significance test, that was the flow chart along with the Google form, the know your formula sheet, and then of course the gallery walk that we just talked about. 
And uh, we're gonna send you off into breakout rooms, groups of three. And uh, you're gonna have seven minutes in your breakout room. And here's what I'd like you to do in your breakout room. First thing is I'd like you to introduce yourself to uh, your other two partners that you're gonna be working with. There will be two breakout sessions today. So you're gonna get to work with these same people a couple of times. So introduce yourself. And then I would like you to choose one of these. So right now you should be looking at these five strategies. Choose one of these that you've tried before or that you would like to try. And I'd just like you to share that with the group. Like uh, which one did you choose? And what do you like about it? Like, what is it about that activity that you think would be helpful for students that your students might need? So in your seven minutes that you have, I think Lee is actually even gonna set you up with a timer. Introduce yourselves first. And then I'd like you to identify one of these five strategies and why you like it. So Lee, we can go ahead and send them off to the breakout rooms. Great, the breakout rooms are open. Okay, it looks like we have everybody back here in the main room. I was able to pop into a few of the breakout rooms there and say hello to everybody. And I'll do the same in the next uh, little breakout session that we have. Uh, one thing that I wanted to comment on from the first part of the presentation, the Google form that I shared with you, that link is no good for you because it only takes you to the actual form to take it as if you were a student. Um, then I realized that my colleague, Lindsay Gallus was the one that, was, that created it and I don't have editing rights on it. So, I sent her an email, I asked her if she could add me as a collaborator. And uh, when she does, I'll update it on the website. So in that, in that uh, statsmedic.com slash top, uh, top 10 review, I will add that link in there so that you have access to that. One where you can like make your own copy and then use that if you want to with your students. Um, so it is 829, that means my timing feels pretty good right here. We're about halfway through. And I do want to jump into the second half of the list here. So we're going to, we're going to talk through uh, six through 10. And then once again, I'll give you a little chance to, uh, to do a breakout session. And then we should have just a little bit of time at the end if there are uh, questions that you all have. So uh, let's go ahead and move to strategy number six. Uh, I had mentioned this earlier already, but we know how important the investigative task is for a student that wants to do well on the AP exam. And so the first thing is that students have to know what it is. And I remember back to my first couple of years teaching AP stats, I didn't really understand what the investigative task was. I like knew it was there, but I didn't know that it like had content that students had never seen. And my students were not ready for it. And they came back after the AP exam and they said, hey, they put stuff on there that we've never seen before. And I, and I had to apologize because I, I didn't know that. So I think that preparing students for the investigative task is, is really important. So number one, they have to know where it is and what it's worth. So it's question number six in the free response. Uh, College Board recommends 25 minutes. I, I recommend the same to my students. And it is 25% of the free response uh, grade. You know, there's six free response questions, but this one question is 25% of the FRQ. That, that's a lot. This question is worth a lot of points and we wanna make sure that students do well on it. So here's a couple of suggestions that I give to my students when it comes to the investigative task. Um, the first thing is they just have to know that there's gonna be something on there that they've never seen before. We didn't cover it in the, in the curriculum. It wasn't in a homework problem. It was never on a quiz or a test, but it is something that you are able to do with the thinking and reasoning skills that we have helped you to develop this year. So you're gonna use some of the thinking and reasoning that you've used throughout the year. It's just not gonna be about content that you've, that you've seen before. And students have to know this well ahead of time before they, they go into the AP exam. Uh, the next thing is that a typical investigative task is gonna start in the world of known and eventually take you into the world of unknown. And the important thing about that is that you need to get your points in the world of known. Part A, part B, those are gonna be something from the course, something that you've seen before. There's gonna be four to five parts total. You gotta make sure that you get your points on the first couple of parts, because those are, are usually ones that are, are sort of typical, things that you've seen within the course. 
Now, eventually, it's going to veer off into the world of unknown, part C, part D, and you just have to expect that. Uh, the, the next thing I tell them is that very often, the last part of the question in the investigative task, part E, will ask them to look back at their answers from before. And essentially, they have to like see the problem as a whole and like try to identify what is it that the AP exam is trying to show me here? What is it that I could learn by having gone through this series of questions? And then summarize that in the last part. And, and if you can, make specific reference back to the earlier parts, you know, maybe the values you calculated in an earlier part to the question. So I start the lesson by, by talking through this whole idea. What is the investigative task? Here's some strategies. Now, what do I do after that? Well, I, I always give them a, a, an investigative task. And I got a whole bunch of them that I really like. The one I, I put in here, 2011, this was a question where it was like a multiple choice, uh, one question test. And you're trying to estimate the proportion of students that would get it correct uh, based on some strategies. And there's a tree diagram that's in it. Uh, I think it's a pretty representative type problem for, for what an investigative task looks like. But I like a lot of other ones too. I like 09, I like 2019. You know, you really could pick any of them. Um, and so what do I do with that? I, I have each student try it individually first as if it was the AP exam, which means I get out the timer and I say, you got 25 minutes. Let's see what you can come up with on your own. When the, when the timer goes off, I have them join together with a, a partner, pair up, and see if they can fill in some holes. You know, maybe there was something that their partner got that they didn't get. See if they can like modify their answer a little bit, make it a little bit better. Next, I show them some sample student responses. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Frappy style. Frappy, of course, stands for free response, AP problem, yay. Um, but the idea of a Frappy is you wanna show students some student work and maybe it's not perfect, it's missing something, but the students have to identify what's missing. And that gives you a little bit of an opportunity to talk about the rubric, how it would be graded. And so you go through some sample student responses, uh, hopefully ending with one that, that might be a four out of four, a full credit. Um, talk through the rubric, and then you're gonna have students grade their own work. Like based on what we talked about with the rubric, where do you think you would land on this? Would you have gotten a two out of four or a three out of four? Um, you know, grade your own work there. Uh, oh, and then at the end, like do a little bit of reflection. Like how did you feel when you got to the investigative part of the task? Because a lot of students, that's the, the hard part. They get to the part of the question where they're like, I've never heard of this before. What is this? Uh, they have to fight through that like fear that happens. And so having them reflect on the whole experience I think is valuable. Okay, up next, uh, one of my other favorite activities in the review is uh, I use state plan do conclude for my confidence intervals and significance tests. I know there's a lot of different other formats out there. Whatever format you use, the idea is this. You get uh, four students at a table. Each one of those four students is gonna get a different inference question. And usually I do significance tests on this. And the last time I did this, these were the four uh, significance tests that I chose. And I think the reason I chose these four was because I wanted a mix of, of means and proportions and one sample and two sample. And so each one of the four students has their own question sitting in front of them, okay? And then I set a timer. And in the first four minutes, they have to read the question and they have to do the state, what, what I call the state, sort of the setup of the problem there. Um, then after those four minutes, they're gonna slide it over Yes, I, I see the comment here. This is, a, this is a challenging to do in COVID, but there would be six feet apart, <laughs> four desks, six feet apart, shuffling the papers around. So after four minutes, they shuffle it six feet over to the next person. And that person then has to read the question, look through the state, right? See if there's anything that needs to be corrected. And then it's their job to do the plan. And so you'll notice I increased the time a little bit there because they have to read through the state from the previous student and make any corrections. Now, each of the four students should have their own like color marker or pen so that you can tell like whose work is whose. And then after the plan, you shuffle to the next, you, you slide the papers over. The next student has to look at the first two, state and the plan, and then they have to do the do. And then of course, the final step is to do the conclusion there. And that, you know, they have seven minutes because they have to look at the previous three as well as the final one. Uh, 
And then at the end of the whole thing, I can share the solutions to all four of the problems and students can go through and, and sort of check their work and their, their uh, group's work uh, as they go through those, those four parts there. So that's the state plan do conclude uh, round table. Okay, up next uh, is the practice exam. And um, I, I gotta, I gotta uh, confess to something here. Early on in my AP Stats teaching career, uh, I had this idea that in the review, if I could just have them do six practice exams, they would have seen everything that they needed to and they would ace the exam, right? So I just fed them practice exam after practice exam after practice exam. And the problem with that was by the time I gave them like the second or the third one, they were just like over it. You know, they couldn't stay focused. Like this, they just didn't want to like put the time and energy into it. And so what I've discovered is that you have to disguise your practice exams. You have to present them in various ways so that they feel different. But in reality, the kids are just doing some practice exams. So here are my disguises that I currently have available to me. Number one, I do this at the beginning of the review. I'm actually gonna do this on Thursday and Friday with my students. I give them what's called a diagnostic test. And in this one, I say, no studying, no preparation. It's the beginning of the review. I just want to get an idea of where you are. So let's try this diagnostic test. And since it's the first one, they're usually pr pretty okay with like doing that. The next strategy that I use uh, is one that you may have actually seen. There's a blog post by Jeff Eicher, an awesome blog post on StatsMedic uh, about making three quizzes that combine together to make one AP exam. And so the, the three quizzes are actually split up by content, the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year. And so the nice thing is that students can sort of focus on that content, right? In the beginning of the year for the first quiz, in the middle of the year for the second quiz, and the end of the year for the third quiz. And uh, then at the end, we actually combine all three of those quizzes and we look at what they would have scored if it were an AP exam. You know, it's 40 multiple choice and six free response, but it's been broken up into three chunks. Uh, so I'll start that in two weeks. In two weeks, we'll have our first quiz. Now, there is your traditional practice exam. Uh, I've done this in class. It usually takes three class periods. I've done it on a Saturday before. The only way that works is if you buy pizza. Um, I do like the Saturday one because it's three hours. Like I can give them an actual three hours and they can feel what that feels like. I'm not doing that this year for, for various reasons, but we are gonna do it in class uh, this year as three days. I'm gonna take three days to do a practice exam. And then of course I have a final exam for my, my course and really it's just an AP exam, but because it's a final exam and it has like weight to the grade, students are typically pretty bought into like trying hard on the, on the final exam. So here are your four practice exams, but with four different disguises. And if you can keep students like engaged and interested in all four of these, they're going to be like in a really good position come AP exam because they've seen so many questions. They've seen all the different types of questions. Um, I see the question here from, from Kim. Uh, I do grade the quizzes because I want to give them feedback on the free response, you know, feedback about the way the rubrics work and what you need for full credit. Um, it, is, it is a fair amount of work doing all that grading of the free response, but I, I really do think it's worth it. I think it really positively impacts their, their AP scores when they get that feedback. Oh, and scaling the results. I, I certainly scale the results to AP exam. So like 70 to 72 is what you need for a five. I make that a 90 in my class. Um, so I, I do, I guess, curve those according to the uh, AP exam. Okay, number nine, really important one for students. They like uh, they think that the calculator is going to save them on the AP exam. And so they want to know everything that they need to know about the calculator. So my colleague Lindsay and I, we put together a, a document and it's like three pages. It's PDF. You can get it on the website and it literally has every single calculator command that you might need on the AP exam. It tells you when you, when, when you can use it and it shows you like how to use it. And so students love this. They love like having it all in one document. I take them through it. I sort of talk through what's what. Um, we look at it on the calculator. They know where that is on the, on the calculator. Um, and then the next thing that I do is I, I have uh, an activity for them to do that's calculator uh, related. So I actually wanna show you this one here. So 
On this uh, page here, if you click on know your calculator functions um, and you scroll down, here is the uh, summary document. So this is the, the document that Lindsay and I put together. You can see it is, is very thorough. It, oh, I guess it's four pages. Has every single calculator command that students might need. But the other thing that I, I want you to be aware of is if you scroll down here, there is an activity that goes along with this. And what we did in this activity is we presented several questions and we told students, you don't have to answer the question. All you have to tell me is what calculator command would I use in order to solve this? And so some of them are significance tests, some are confidence intervals, some are binomial, some are normal distribution calculations, but they have to identify the calculator command. And then if you have time, you can actually have them use the calculator to come up with an answer, but they don't have to show work on this. They just have to say calculator command answer. Like that's what we're looking for on this. And so you can uh, access that activity here. There's also uh, an answer key that goes along with it. And that's a full class period going through this document and then going through that uh, activity with students uh, typically takes about a, a full exam period there. Um, so that's number nine. All right, we are to number 10. Uh, and this is also one of my favorite days of the year. I usually do this about, I don't know, four or five days before the AP exam. Students come into class and I'm like, listen, today, I am gonna tell you exactly what is gonna be on the AP exam this year. And I go through and I fill out the entire whiteboard with my AP exam predictions. Like question by question, I go through one through six, I tell them exactly what they're gonna see. Now, the reality is that I'm gonna be right on some of these and I'm gonna be way, way, way wrong on some of these, but um, I have done fairly well in the past. This one in particular, 2019, if you look at number five, I called the two sample Z test for the difference of proportions. I was so proud of myself. My students were so like happy to come back from the AP exam and tell me that I guessed the right significance test. But uh, I got them wrong the previous three years. So uh, you can't necessarily trust my predictions, but I will make predictions on StatsMedic and I'll put those out like probably about a week before the AP exam. So even if you wanna share those and say, hey, there's this crazy dude from Michigan, he makes predictions every year. Here's what he thinks is gonna be on the AP exam. Um, but don't make any promises because I'm gonna be right on some and I'm gonna be wrong on some. But it does get students starting to think about the types of problems they can expect on the free response because there are some sort of categories that we, you know, we can typically expect is gonna appear on the AP exam. So I still find this to be a helpful activity for students. Okay, that brings us to the end of the second half of the list here. And once again, I am gonna ask you to uh, go into breakout rooms and we're gonna give you five minutes on this one because you've already uh, met each other, you've done your introductions. And so um, I'd like you to look through this list right now and identify one of these that you have done before or that you would like to try and talk about that one with your group and especially talk about you know what uh why you think it's helpful what do you what did you like about that particular activity so investigative task remember that would be giving students an investigative task and taking them through it the round table is when you have four students passing papers around uh, the practice exam is like the disguised practice exams calculator functions you have that document but you also have the activity that goes with it and then the AP exam uh, predictions there. So we'll take five minutes in your breakout rooms. And then once you come back from the breakout rooms, uh, we'll, we'll open it up for some uh, question and answers. So Lee, if you wanna go ahead and send them off to their breakout rooms. All right, the breakout rooms are open. It looks like we have uh, looks like we have everybody back here from the uh, breakout room. So I uh, hope you had some good discussion. Got a chance to chat with some of uh, your AP Stats colleagues. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of resources here, and then I'll open it up for a few minutes if there are any uh, questions that people might have. Uh, there's the website again for the handouts. I will update the uh, Google form for the uh, name that significance test. I'll put that on that that website there. But all of the, the strategies that I talked about, the handouts, the videos, all of those you can access through that uh, URL that's there. Uh, feel free to contact me or my colleague, Lindsay. Uh, we're the ones that, that are behind StatsMedic, very uh, willing to help answer any questions you might have if you want to email. Um, 
Twitter, Facebook, we have a Facebook group. If you're not in the Facebook group, you should, you should be in the Facebook group. So search for Stats Medic Teacher Community. Um, and it's a great group of people. Awesome, amazing, supportive people. So um, with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions that you might have. So if you could drop those in the chat, um, I'd be willing to answer any questions, talk through anything, any of the specific strategies that you're wondering about or resources that you might be wondering about, feel free to uh, drop those questions in the chat. I think I saw uh, two questions, um, kind of like, I don't know the, I don't know what, what the review process is, but I mean, you've gave your top 10 tips, but like in terms of like number of weeks or number of class periods, maybe that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, actually, so on Stats Medic, if you go to the 150 days of AP Stats, um, one of the links after all the chapters or the units is my review schedule. And like, honestly, what we put on Stats Medic, what Lindsay and I put on Stats Medic is what we do in our classroom. It's not like a, a doctored up version for the internet. So the schedule that you see there is is very, very close to like what how I run it in my own classroom. So that's 150 days of AP stats, uh, the review, you'll, you'll see a link for the review there. Uh, um, a couple of other questions. Yeah, you can see them in the chat there. There's quite a few actually. Yeah. Um, so I see, will I do anything different for the, for the digital version? <laughs> uh, I only have a handful of kids that are taking the digital version. Some of my kids that have been online all year and uh, I'm going to I'm going to give them lots of digital resources. So I'm going to, you know, uh, leave access to the Stats Medic review course. Um, I'm I'm going to probably share some other like YouTube videos, uh, but but digital resources, sort of like access them when you can type resources. That that's my my strategy with my uh, with my online students that are that are going to do the online version. Um, my class periods are about 52 minutes. Uh, well, they're normally 54 minutes this year. I think they're 49 because of COVID. We had to modify our schedule, but about 50 minutes. Um, any particular type of problem that I have a good feel for being on this year's test? Uh, I haven't really sat down with my crystal ball yet to look to think about the predictions, but I promise you a week, a week ahead of time on Stats Medic, I'll, I'll release my, my predictions. Um, Susan says, do you really think that a student who is so-so during the year could actually pass the AP exam given they participate in an amazing review? 100% I think that, but it, it requires that they are, are focused and hardworking for the last three or four weeks of, of school. And I tell my students that, I'm like, you may have been a two all year long, but if right now for the next four weeks you get serious and you do what I ask you to do, uh, you, you can pull this off. I, I really do believe they can pull that off because I think the review has such a big difference on AP score. I mean, I think good instruction matters and you gotta be great all year long, but like the AP review has such an impact, plus or minus two on their AP score if, if they work hard in the review. Uh, Karina says, how much of your review work is graded? Uh, so a lot of it is graded just based on completion. So I, you know, my students go through the Stats Medic review course and they have to like complete the guided notes and the practice problems. All of those are graded for, for completion. Um, in terms of correctness, the only things I grade in the review, I grade the three quizzes that combine to one AP exam, and then I grade the, the final exam. And, and that's enough. I mean, that's, that's plenty of work uh, already, but those are the things that actually get graded for uh, correctness. Um, Sue asks, have you already started reviewing? Um, amazingly enough, I did finish the content before spring break. Uh, and so today was my first day back. Now I essentially lose this whole week because we do our standardized tests like SAT, PSAT, work keys, but I'm gonna have about four weeks of review. So starting next week, Monday is when we officially like sort of kick off the, the review. I'm um, looking through some other questions. Uh, there was a question that somebody asked about how do you review assumptions and conditions? Cause that typically trips students up. Yeah, uh, I do think that student written inference test is a great way sort of secretly to have them uh, thinking about conditions because they have to write the questions such that the conditions are satisfied. And a lot of times when they first write their questions, it's not satisfied. And by going through that editing process, they're like 
thinking about it in the other direction, instead of the direction where like they have, they're given the problem, they have to check the condition. Now they have to like create the problem that satisfies the condition. So I, I think that's really helpful. And then of course, any of those like inference activities that we do, they're getting more practice with conditions. You know, the round table, they're gonna get practice with conditions. Um, you know, name that significance test, depending on if you ask them to do one of the tests, they might get practice with that. But a lot of it is just practice, you know, exposure to, to the conditions. Okay, Lee, do you um, see anything else in there that I yeah, missed? I, I don't really uh, see anything that you've left off here. Um, if your question was not answered by Luke in the past uh, five minutes or so, uh, feel free to type it in the chat right now. Got another minute or two. So I, we thank all of you for uh, being here tonight. I will say that um, this is uh, one of one of our larger uh, sessions uh, that we've had. And uh, if you think this is useful, make sure you share the recording. Um, you know, there's a good recording that we post for tonight's session onto our YouTube channel, um, teaching statistics across any setting. Make sure you share that with your teachers or maybe come watch it next year um, as you're as you're thinking about reviewing um, a year from now. Yeah, kind of to back up on Lee um, in a, about a week. Um, I'm going to share a, a Google form, not a Google form, but a spreadsheet that has a list of all the, the speakers that have, have presented during the last year and then a link to the YouTube for that particular uh, speaker. So as you know, I mean, we get really busy during the school year. And then if you're like me, I have one foot thinking about this year's exam and the other foot's already thinking about next year's prep for the next year's class. And so it's during that few months in between, they start really getting ready. So We'll present those things to you guys again so that you can access them uh, to meet your needs. And um, and this is obviously very helpful today from Luke. So there was there was one other question that popped up about breakout rooms. Um, Luke, I don't know if you had seen this one, um, how you would adapt the roundtable idea to breakout rooms. I don't know if you've thought about doing that. Yeah, so I would make breakout rooms of size four, and that four is the group of four. And then I'd have to make like a Google Doc that has all four questions in it. And they, the kids would have to decide like who's going to start on one, two, three, and four. And then essentially, you know, I might set a timer or I'd send them messages through the Zoom breakout. Like, okay, it's time to move to the next question. And I would keep the time and uh, they would just have to like move to the next question in the Google Doc. And then you could obviously monitor their work in the Google Doc as they're, they're doing it. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. We're really appreciative of this community. Yes, very appreciative. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me for today. I appreciate the invite, Bob and Lee. Well, thank you very much and be safe, everyone. Hopefully uh, we'll see you guys at some point again. So long, everyone. <laughs>